Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you once again for another wonderful opportunity to bring worship today. Thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath day that you've given us so that we can come bold before your throne of grace, that we can find help in a time of need. Lord, we thank you for the special care that you've given us through the week, and now here we are to honor your name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Or Feliz Sábado. Amen. There's a lot of new faces today. So we have a lot of wonderful friends visiting us from all over the place. So we thank you. Thank you for being with us today. And this is a wonderful place to be. All right. So let's see what the Bible has for us today. Please open your Bibles to the book of Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. Last week, we were in the good story of the book of Exodus. You guys may recall we talked about how Moses and the children of Israel, God visited them, and he promised that he was going to get them out of bondage. And we talked about the idea that when God intervenes, there's no time to be discouraged. But when God says he's going to do something, right, we have to let him work under his terms and not under our expectations. Because when we put expectations upon God, listen, we're going to get disappointed. We need to let God work on his ground. Amen? And we learned that often in tribulations, you know, we're just going to have to go through those trials. God does not always take us out of those trials, but guess what he does? He will definitely walk with that trial with you. Amen? And so in this story, it's almost like a little follow-up to what we talked about last time. But now we're talking about the story of where now the children of Israel are going into the promised land. Okay, into the promised land. So Joshua chapter 4, and hang in there. We got a little bit of an old English here, but this is what the story has for us. Beginning at verse 1, Joshua chapter 4. And the Bible says, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordans, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. What did he ask to take? Okay, keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to those details. It says, Twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe of a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be, what does it say? Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that. A sign among you that when, who's going to ask? What does that imply? The next generation. Keep that in mind. A next generation. It says, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what mean ye? by these stones, or as other translations say, what do these, what? Stones mean. We're going to come back to that. Then you shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were what? Were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a what? A memorial, we'll come back to that, a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. May the Lord add a special blessing to the reading of his word. Let us bow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, once again we thank you for the freedom of worship that we yet have. To come together to this wonderful place in which we call a sanctuary, Lord, a place of refuge, a place of worship. 
And we know that at this very hour, we are safe because you are with us. And so we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity to come together for fellowship, enjoying the Sabbath school time, the learning environment, and fellowship with one another. But right now, it is time, Lord, so that we can listen to your words. So once again, Lord, you know what each needs we all have. We pray that you'll speak to us and that we have an open mind to hear your instructions for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the idea of today. The problem of forgetting. What are we addressing? The problem of forgetting. Now, none of us forget anything. We do pretty good, right? Come on now. We are people that constantly watch. You know what I'm talking about. You forget the car keys inside the car. You've been there. So think about this, the problem of forgetting. But I'd like to share with you this incident that took place several years back. After stopping for gas in Montgomery, Alabama, this is a true story, Sam drove more than five hours. How long? More than five hours before noticing that he had left somebody behind. Now you would think, oh, hopefully it's just the dog. No. Or his uncle or somebody. No. He left his wife behind. <laughs> so what does he do? Gen gentlemen. G gentlemen, remember this. So the next town, he asked the police to help him get in touch with his wife. He's five, year, five hours away. And then he finally makes contact with his wife. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for me to tell you what happened, right? Well, sorry, there's no follow-up. It, it just doesn't, they didn't tell us what, how they reacted. But what did he do? He had to admit with great embarrassment that he had just, that he just didn't notice her absence. The problem of what? Forgetting. How Sam could forget his wife is beyond our comprehension. Do you agree? But wait, we are not much different in our relationship with God. Sometimes we forget God, about God, and the things about God more than five hours, a full day, two days, a full week, and often many days we get taken by the cares of this life and God is far from our thoughts. True or false? It happens, my friends. It's human nature. Now, you may recall the times you ran or walked by a tree or, or, or you saw a little rock that has the following note. And you know, you, I know you saw this. I know you've seen this. It's a little phrase that says, John was here. Or Jesse was here. You've seen those, right? Carved in the tree. And what is the deal with that? It is a special note. So carefully note this. It is a special note that someone has left so that someone else can notice and think about the evidence of that person's existence in that particular spot. And so when you come and you read, oh, somebody was here. So and so was in this place. And you see, my friends, God himself throughout history has left little notes to make known unto us that he also was what? Here. Why did God do this? Because he knew of our problem. And what is the problem? The problem of forgetting. The problem of forgetting. Why do many of our young generations leave the church? Several weeks ago, we had 
our union president, he gave us a wonderful sermon and he was explaining to us powerful reasons as to why young people leave the church. And it has nothing to do with the lack of entertainments. But I'd like to add an extra one today. One of the main reasons is because the older generations of Christians, we are not doing a good job in pointing the younger generations to God's memorial stones. Because you better believe it, the young generation are asking the question, how did we get here? And the biggest mistake that we can do as members is not telling them. Oh, you should know that. You shouldn't be asking those questions. Just know that you need to be here. No, that's no longer the options. When they ask, how did we get here? We need to be able to demonstrate a living faith, amen? And point them back to what does the Bible say? God's memorial stones. God's writings that say, I was what? Was here. Now watch this. This is the wonderful inspiration from the spirit of prophecy. This is what the messenger of the Lord wrote in her biography. She said the following, in reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, praise God, as I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. And then she says the powerful underline, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. The problem of forgetting, my friends, is a dangerous problem, especially when it has to do with our faith in God. So this morning, I'd like to share with you the story of the Old Testament and the times of Joshua, the leader that succeeded Moses before the people of Israel entered the Promised Land. You see, God instructed Joshua to illustrate in visual forms. In visual what? Visual forms. The signatures of his presence before his people because God knew that once they would enter the promised lands, they would eventually what? They would eventually forget about him and his ways. So let's go back to Joshua chapter 4. So what's happening? They reach the Jordans, and they're about to cross, and who is leading the procession? The priests, and they're carrying what? Now, how important was the Ark of the Covenant in that time? So important because it represents what? The presence of God. And inside the, car, after the covenant, what was, it? What, what was in it? The Ten Commandments. And it was also a symbol of covenant. A symbol of what? Of covenant of what God was offering to do for his people, but in return he was expecting what? Faithfulness. And as long as they kept that relationship, they, it would allow God to faithfully do what he promised them to do. And so, therefore, the priests carrying, the Levites, they're carrying this ark, and they're about to cross. What was the instruction that God gave Joshua? The moment you cross the Jordan, what were you to do? Take from the middle of the river, they were to find what? Twelve stones, each stone representing what? Each of the tribes. And they were to take those stones, and they were to put those stones in a particular spot, and they were supposed to become an illustrative form as a reminder of God's what? Presence among them. But it is interesting, what needed to happen before they would get those stones out of the water? The waters needed to what? Divide. Who was going to do that? Joshua? Were they going to do a, a system where they were going to go ahead and detour part of the waters so that they would have dry land? No. God was going to do his thing once again to demonstrate his presence and his faithfulness that he was still with his people. And so they did it. They pass, and they cross, and then... Once they would take those stones, 
Those stones were supposed to be a sermons, a writings, that when the young generation would ask, what do those stones mean? What was supposed to be their answer? Oh, we crossed the river because uh, we did this, we did this, we did this. No. We crossed the river because God himself, what? Did his thing. He still kept his promise that he was still going to be with his people. And so, therefore, watch this. So let's break this down. Memorial stones. Let's read this. Let's break this down. The memorial stones were objects of remembrance implying the following. Number one, the new generation wouldn't have an idea of the past if not for the what? For the stones. Passing the legacy and information. So we have to do a good job at that. Number two, God's people are vulnerable to do what? To forget. Now that they were finally entering the promised land, they were in danger of forgetting God's ways. And you know what, my friends? Eventually they did. How do we know this? Because if you have your Bibles, guess what? After the book of Joshua comes the book of, come on, there's a Bible trivia question. The book of Judges. And if you read the book of Judges, it is a constant testimony of what? Of their backsliding, of their going back to other gods, and so forth. So the book of Judges reveals that clearly they did forget. And number three, God needs for his people never to forget his dealings with them. Because he wants to make them as witnesses unto what? the surrounding nation, so that others can see that God indeed is real. So, here's an amazing fact. So let's read verse 7 again. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordans were what? Were cut off. That's a very important word in the story. Were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant when it passed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were what? were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Now, here it is. The word cutting off is the same Hebrew word for karat. Now, if you, you can pr pronounce this, kar karat. Can you pronounce that? Karat. All right? Just remember the word karate, but don't say karate. Just say karat. That's a very important Hebrew word in the Old Testament. I'll show you, I'll show you why. Because this Hebrew word translates the following. To make or cut a covenant. To make or what? Cut a covenant. Now what's interesting about this amazing fact is that in the Hebrew Bible, there's at least 50 different words that can be translated as cut off or to cut. And seven of those 50 words are the most common ones, but guess what? Only this Hebrew word is the one that is associating with cutting a covenant. With cutting a what? So interesting, the cutting of the waters is not just simply the dividing of waters. There is symbolism behind the cutting because it has to do with what? Not just crossing over, but also the crossing and renewing a covenant with who? With God, and it is interesting, in those days, when somebody was making a covenant with somebody, they would take an animal, because blood had to be involved in this covenant. So they would cut the covenant, and both parties involved in the covenant, where they would split the animal, and they would walk in the middle of the animal as they were signature, as they were entering into a special covenant. And it is interesting, here, they are walking through what? through the waters that God himself is the one doing. It's not the works of the Israelites. It is the intervention of God for his people. And so watch this. Here's the amazing fact. So the cutting of the waters, the covenant renewal, this is what it means. The Ark of the Covenant going through the Jordans and staying there while the people were crossing was a way of God reestablishing his covenant promises with his people. Can we say amen? God is still cutting that covenant today. 
through Jesus Christ, through what Jesus is doing in a better sanctuary. Where is he at? In the heavenly sanctuary. You see, my friends, that's what we see today. So, the sight was incredible. The priests were standing still in the middle of the Jordan, bearing the ark, while the people watched the waters divide. And this, my friends, was a miniature Red Sea experience. Except this time around, they were coming to conquer the enemy and not running away from the enemy. So, examples of objects and symbols of remembrance and dangerous of forgetting. So if you have your notes, if you have somewhere to write notes, I'm going to give you some scripture references, but we won't have time to read those this morning. But I know you can write them down and study this on your own. Objects and symbols of remembrance are all over the Bible. Here's the first one. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Now guys, you should know this one. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. What does it say? Remember. Remember the Sabbath day. And so the Sabbath day in that particular text was a what? A memorial to his creation. Symbol one. Here's another one. Write this down. Exodus 39, 6 through 7. Exodus 39, 6 through 7. The priestly garments, the effort contains 12 stones. Those stones were supposed to be symbol to the 12 tribes of Israel. And guess what? They were also as memorial stones so that when the priest would go into the sanctuary, he was remembering what? The names of the children of Israel as he was interceding in the ministry of the sanctuary. So once again, memorial stones, symbols of remembrance. Exodus chapter 6, sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9. What do we have there? We have there the writing of the law of God as a reminder of who God is. You may recall, God said, you shall have it what? In your heart, and you shall write it where? In the doorpost, everywhere, so that your children would know the God of Israel. Here's another one, Deuteronomy chapter 27. The third set of stones of remembrance to keep God's law before them. Now, Deuteronomy 27, guess what? Was fulfilled in Joshua chapter 8. In Joshua chapter 8, there were another set of stones. In this particular setting, these stones were painted white, again, as a symbol of God's law, as a symbol of God's righteousness among his people. So again, you see memorial stones right there. Exodus 24, verse 4. Exodus 24, verse 4. You see Moses in the receiving of the law before he goes to the mountain. The Bible says that he set up an altar. It was the first altar where they did the burnt offering in the Exodus time. And this altar consisted, guess what, of how many stones? Twelve stones. Right there. You see it. Here's another one. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18, verse 31. You see the story of Elijah, and you remember the prophets of Baal, 450, and they had that showdown right there. What did he establish in their midst? An altar, and guess how many stones? Twelve stones. You see the symbolism right there. The garments of the Israelites, the little blue tessels on their garments, they were symbols of what? of the righteousness of the law, and they had to keep that before their eyes always. And here's another one, which is a sad. It is the story of Nehemiah, chapter 13, verse 23. When Nehemiah came back to the city, he noticed that the Hebrew children, they spoke another language except the Hebrew language. They had forgotten the language of their fathers. And he brought that, and because they forgot the language, of, if they did not know the Hebrew language, guess what also they don't know? The scriptures. Forgetting the, the language of their fathers is forgetting, essentially, the scriptures. In the New Testament, here's another one. Revelation 2.5, one of the seven churches. 
Don't forget where you have fallen him from. So again, there's constant scriptures where it's pointing us to what? To remember. Remember where we have been. And then the most popular text in the New Testament about remembering. The communion. 1 Corinthians 11. Right? The covenant. And do this in remembrance of what? Of me. So everything remembering, pointing us back to God. And so those are symbols. Now let's go back to Joshua chapter 4. What took place? Finally, they did as they were commanded. They crossed. They not only took out 12 stones to put on the side, but they also left another set of 12 stones in the river so that when the waters went back, guess what? There was also another set of stones in the water. So the stones that were outside on the lands, they would point to the stones that were left also in the Jordan. Again, as symbols, as memorial stones of God's intervention for his people. So what do we do with this today, my friends? What is the big idea of 12 stones? Do we have those stones today? Not necessarily. It's been a long time ago. Most likely some other nation or some people might have taken the stones and they're no longer there. But you know where the testimony is? In the Bible. So how do we know about those stones? Based upon the inspiration of the Bible. So here it is. Today, my friends, the Bible is God's powerful memorial stone. Why do we need stones of remembrance today? Here it is. Number one. We need the stones as a reminder of God's providences in our lives. A reminder of his power. And if he was faithful in the past, guess what? He is going to be faithful when? In the present and in the future to come. So I'll reference this, Joshua chapter 4, verse 22. Notice what it says here. Verse 22 and 23. It says, Then... Ye shall let your what? Your children or the next generation know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on what? Dry land. And for the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over. And notice the comparisons. Whatever took place in the Jordan was also a reminder of what? What does it say? Notice. As the Lord your God, what? Did so. It doesn't say he thought about it. It says he did so to the what? To the Red Sea. It's a link which he dried from before us until we were gone over. So once again, the crossing of the Jordans and the crossing of the Red Sea was all evidence of God's intervention for his people. Amen? It is impossible, my friends, not to keep in remembrance what took place in the middle of these two events. God's providence and miracles for God's people in the desert for 40 years. And yet, God was always with them. In spite of the complainings, were those easy 40 years for Moses? No. The people were constantly doing what? Complaining, murmuring. In fact, not only were they complaining, but they wanted to do what? They wanted to go back to bondage. No, my friends. Here's the text, Patriots and Prophets, page 484. The influence of this miracle, both upon the Hebrews and upon their enemies, Again, not just the Hebrews, but upon their enemies, was of great importance. It was an assurance to Israel of God's continued presence and protection. We need the stones as a reminder of our origins. As a reminder of what? Of our origins, where we came from. Watch this. Verse 23. You notice the phrase. For the Lord, what does it say? It doesn't say the Lord God. It says the Lord, your God. And it says, once again, in the middle of the verse, it says, and the Lord, your what? 
And if you study this carefully, that's repeated at least four times in Joshua chapter 4. So what does it mean? The Lord thy God, it shows us that we belong to who? We belong to God. Can we say amen to that? Some years ago, there was a preacher with a daughter who kept a silence, a daily notebook. On one page, she had drawn a picture of her father. And interestingly, right under that picture, she wrote the name and the address. And every time she would show that notebook and the picture of her father and the name and the address, and, and when she was asked, why are you putting the address on this? And she stated that she had been watching a movie that had to do about forgetting something. And she said, if I ever forget who I am, I want everybody to know who I belong to. That's amazing. We belong to who everyone's. We belong to God. And finally, my friends, we need a stone as a reminder of God's mission to save the lost. As God's mission to do what? To save the lost, to show his ways. Verse 24, notice what it says. That the, all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord, and that is mighty, and that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. You see, my friends, we have this stone today, and it has the testimony of the everlasting gospel. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of what? Their testimony. Your testimony is important today to proclaim the good news unto others. Amen? It is easy, my friends, to get lost. It is easy to forget and to get lost. For instance, in the case of this family from Massachusetts, who called 911 after getting lost in a corn maze, they went through it and they got lost in a corn maze. Well, praise the Lord, they had a phone. The place was Connors Farms in Danvers, Massachusetts. The couple and their two ch small children became lost as sunset was approaching. So when they called 911 from the inside of the maze, the police officer showed up with the canine assistance, and finally, they were what? Located and found. I tell you what, those people were happy. Hey, man? They were lost, and they were now what? Found. The farmer manager offered them free tickets so they could come back. <laughs> As if they were going to come back. You see, my friends, it is easy to get lost. But you will not get lost if you have the map. Amen? God's memorial stones. But if you don't have this map, you will get lost. But even if we are in troubling situations, and if you got the map, guess who you also have? The author of the map. Amen? And God is going to show himself here today. So the writing, my friends, will shift from I was here to I'm still here. And it will also have a little side note at the bottom that will say, and I will always be here. Do you believe that this morning? My beloved church, it is the will of God that we keep fresh before us the memorials of his presence constantly. Amen? The Bible, his memorial stones, the memorial of his law, his Sabbath, the monuments of prophecy for our times remind us that Jesus is coming again. And we need to believe that. The Bible says, Hebrews chapter 10. Let's just read that and then we can close with that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37. Watch this. 
Hebrews 10, 37. Look at this. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, what does it say? Will come. And what does it say? And will not tarry. Do you believe that, stones? Trust me. You know what I call it a stone? Because when you go back to Daniel chapter 2, the image that destroyed, you know, the image that was destroyed was destroyed by what? By a rock cut out without hands. And what does that rock symbolize, my friends? It symbolizes the second coming of Christ, that stone. That is a big memorial stone. We're looking forward to that one. Amen? How many of us would like to say, Lord, help me never to forget. I can forget about many things, but I do not want to forget you. Amen? And God has written the notes so that we don't forget. Let us bow. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you once again for giving us this wonderful stories of the Bible, in this case, the story of Joshua, where we're given stories so that we can learn powerful lessons, the stories of the memorial stones. It's just like in their generation, those stones were preaching to the next generation so that they would know that God is, is still there with them. In today's generation, we have the Bible that also shows that God is still with us. And Lord, we pray that we will not forget the promises of the Bible, that you will come again. We pray that we will not forget that you're still in our midst, leading us, constantly cutting the special covenant of relationship with us. Satan will want to make us to forget. But we believe in somebody who is much more powerful than Satan. For the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we claim that promise today. We thank you for the Bible because the Bible becomes this powerful memorial stones of your presence of the past and today and of the world to come. Help us to faithfully keep that in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.